Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Yvette Shaleen will present Neuroinflammatory Hypotheses of Depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $360 million to fund more than 5,000 grants to more than 4,000 scientists around the world. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, post-traumatic stress, addiction, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Yvette Shaleen. Dr. Shaleen is the McClure Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Research in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. She is a member of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation Scientific Council and has received several foundation grants, including a Young Investigator Grant and two Independent Investigator Grants. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Shaleen's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I will present your questions to Dr. Shaleen and we will discuss as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Yvette Shaleen. Yvette, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Jeff. I'm uh, just getting my, my slides up and going here. Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Can you see them? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about neuroinflammation and depression. Um, let's see if I can make it advance. Um, just click on the slide. I did click on the, oh, okay. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about this in several different sections. Um, first, we're going to have um, how uh, inflammation got changed and altered over the course of evolution um, so that it became a, a negative instead of a positive thing. Um, we'll talk about inflammation pathways to get to that negative outcome. Um, inflammation factors and inflammatory cell types, the brain effects of inflammation, inflammation affects multiple disease processes, factors that decrease inflammation, and then finally antidepressant treatment effects. So we'll start with a definition of neuroinflammation, uh, which has been defined as the interplay of the immune system and the central nervous system involving pro-inflammatory cytokines and related molecular processes that lead to microglial activation and astrogliosis. This is referred to as neuroinflammation. So by the end of this lecture, I hope you'll know a little bit more about um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, what I mean by that, and what are the molecular processes, and what are microglia? Um, all of those are important in understanding inflammation. So we know that inflammation causes depression. We know that, um, for instance, people who receive interferon treatment um, had a subsequent depression in about 30 to 40 percent of all the people who received that treatment, even if they had uh, never received um, even if they had never had depression before. So commonly interferon was used for, for conditions like hepatitis C, and so it was completely unrelated to depression. Um, further, when people with um, treatment-resistant depression are examined, when their spinal fluid or their blood is examined, a much greater 
percentage of those then in the general population have elevated inflammatory factors. So as you can see, the, it's a two-way street. Depression causes neuroinflammation, and inflammation can cause depression. So is inflammation necessarily a bad thing? So not under the right circumstances. At, um, at low levels, it can protect against infection. We need inflammation to be able to stay alive. Without the ability to fight off infections, uh, we wouldn't survive. And in fact, there are congenital conditions like that, and those infants don't survive. Um, at high levels, though, inflammation mediates depression and mediates other illnesses as well. And we'll talk about that a bit besides depression. So from the evolutionary perspective, um, back uh, in, in the early days of the evolution of mankind, uh, you can see here that basically there are a lot of things the body had to be wary of. Predators, pathogens, um, you had to be wary about other people who might be trying to attack you. So in that uh, hunter-gatherer phase, um, inflammation was a necessary and important part of life. And so you could say there was a pro-inflammatory bias. Um, so here, the, the alarm, avoidance, wound healing, and fighting infection. Um, and then um, as we moved into modern times, <clears throat> we have much less in the way of, of uh, germs around. So we have much more um, uh, a sterile environment. Um, we also have many more environmental and psychosocial stresses and a lot of, uh, and because we live longer, a lot of medical illness. Um, so in this environment, um, inflammation becomes actually uh, a negative factor. It's, it's uh, not something that in general helps us other than when we have a severe infection. Um, so we'll talk next about the inflammation pathways to that negative outcome. Uh, and this is a sort of synthetic perspective. You can see that there are predisposing factors that predispose to inflammation, such as uh, being overweight or having a history of major depression, having early life, life stress and a genetic predisposition. Um, and then you also have the interplay with the, mut the gut microbiome, all the organisms that the uh, the uh, now estimated to be billions of organisms that live inside of us. Um, and so these factors then lead uh, to increases in inflammation. And when that inflammatory response becomes prolonged, we get what are called sickness behaviors. And those are things like loss of pleasure, um, fatigue, all the kinds of things that you feel like when you're sick. Um, and uh, that has negative health outcome. So you, get, you can get in the presence of, of an exaggerated inflammatory response, you can get persistent inflammation, um, which then can lead on into a long-lasting set of depressive symptoms. Um, and then it, it can sort of set up a, a vicious cycle. So what are those inflammation factors and inflammatory cell types? Oops, this one isn't a very, sorry about this. Um, what we have here, and I'm, I'm, I apologize, it looks quite blurry on my screen. Um, it's trying to show what's going on here in this brain of this depressed person, which is that you have microglial activation. That is a cell type, um, glia usually are resting, they're resting quietly, but when they uh, have these immune factors like IL-1 beta, IL-6, TNF-alpha that, that um, activate them, they go into a, a, an activated state and, and become attackers. So, and this goes on, all of these things go on in the brain. You also have um, excitatory neurotransmitters such as glutamate that, that accelerate this process. So you've got neurotransmitter involvement, cell type involvement, and these floating um, humoral factors floating in our, our blood and in our cerebrospinal fluid that um, all make up what this inflammatory process is. Um, and 
the uh, consequence of that, one of the most distressing things is that people who have um, depression and especially um, various other kinds of inflammatory processes will tell you that it's hard to feel excited about anything. They've lost their sense of pleasure. Um, so the nucleus accumbens is the brain area that's implicated in reward signaling. And you can see here that it's um, getting signals. The nucleus accumbens is this tiny little region way deep in the brain. But it gets signals from medial prefrontal cortex, um, from um, the cingulate cortex that feed in and signal to this reward pathway from other brain regions. Um, and this occurs by dopamine signaling. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's very involved in the ability to have and receive rewards um, in, in the brain. It's a, a brain chemical that makes us feel like we've been rewarded. Um, it's also overactive in some disorders such as um, pathological um, uh, gambling, such as addiction and so forth, but it's underactive in depression and disorders that um, are involved in inflammation. So what do the cell types look like that are involved in depression? Well, on, on the left here, this is a typical resting um, a monocyte, which becomes a microglial cell. And it's, it's a so-called ramified or branching form. You can see all these nice little branches, and it's just kind of reaching out with its arms, embracing the environment, looking for signals from other cells. Um, and then as we move to the right, you see that it becomes progressively less branchy and more amoeboid. And so all the way at the right, Look at this. This is just a big fat amoeba sitting here with no branches. Um, and that's a fully activated microglial cell um, that, that you might see in um, a disorder such as multiple sclerosis. Um, the kinds of microglial cells, activated microglia that are seen in depression typically are these more intermediate forms <coughs> that are not quite so extreme as the ones that we see all the way on the left. But there have been neuropath um, studies showing that people who've died with depression have more of these activated microglial in the, in the, in the brain. <coughs> um, so um, let's see here. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, brain effects of inflammation. And here what we see is the bone marrow, which is where the monocytes are made, out here in the periphery. Um, and in the context of psychosocial stress, catecholamines, such as noradrenaline, you can see here, are released by ac activated sympathetic nervous system fibers to stimulate bone marrow production and release these uh, monocytes. Um, and these enter the periphery where they then encounter, in the presence of stress, they encounter um, stress-induced damage molecular patterns. That's a mouthful. Those are called damps. Um, and um, also bacteria, potentially. So these are all things they can encounter that will accelerate this process. Bacteria um, and uh, other uh, associated patterns that have leaked from the gut here. Um, so if you, have, if you have an infection, it produces this leaky gut. Um, and then um, the inflammatory signaling pathways, such as uh, here you can see NF-kappa-beta, um, lead to the production of mature interleukin um, one, IL-1 beta and IL-6. And these then produce um, uh, the release of other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And um, together, these can access the brain through two different ways. One is a nervous route, so in through nerves, like the vagus nerve. And the other um, is, a, is a humoral route. So in here, they, they get in through the bloodstream. And then finally, there's a cellular route, too, where um, 
sometimes stress produces leakiness in the blood-brain barrier, and so the, the monocytes can enter directly where they then get transformed into macrophages. So these are then active inflammatory cells. Um, and once in the brain, the activated macrophages um, perpetuate this central inflammatory response. Um, and so you've got this vicious cycle, now you've got more inflammation, and it starts all over again. Um, so here's the psychosocial stressor, um, here, which then produces more noradrenaline, and around and around we go. Oh, I meant to do this too, sorry. So these are the, the, the big summary points that stress hormones stimulate bone marrow, the cells are released and counter bacteria and damage associated patterns, activate signal pathways for inflammation, these, these uh, soluble factors access the brain, um, and then the activated monocytes and microglia perpetuate this central inflammation. Um, so what does, what does that do to the brain? Well, when people with um, depression have been examined, there are many different brain regions that are involved in inflammation. So we have not only um, cognitive areas such as um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here um, and the um, dorsal anterior cingulate, but also um, regions like the amygdala that and the orbital frontal cortex that are very involved with emotion. Um, and when you look in these regions, you can see this has been done some with some um, PET scanning. You can see uh, increased inflammation in those brain regions. Um, the, the problem with doing those kinds of studies is so far we don't really have very good PET binding um, strategies. So we're still awaiting um, better technology to be able to really um, examine this carefully. But what we do have is the downstream effects of that. So we have um, less good signaling in response to rewarding um, tasks, for example. Um, and let's see here. We also, in addition to having the, the overall effects on brain regions where we might see smaller volumes or, or less of a functional effect, we have uh, neurotransmitter effects as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and what we see, uh, and this is a, a sort of complicated slide, I'll try to describe it in a way that's as simple as possible. Um, there are sort of three different ways in which inflammation affects brain neurotransmitters. Brain neurotransmitters are the, the chemicals that perpetuate the electrical signal that is responsible for all of the thinking and feeling and everything that, all the brain work that we do. So the pro-inflammatory cytokines um, decrease um, the, re the availability of um, what we call monoamines, and that would be things like serotonin and dopamine and noradrenaline. And they do that by um, decreasing the availability because they have an increase, they increase the uptake so it goes back into the presynaptic terminal. So that's one way that it's done. Um, they also um, uh, decrease the um, availability of monoamines by activating the enzyme indole 2 3 dioxygenase, IDO, um, <coughs> which is, well, I'll show you that on another slide as well, but what it does is it um, shunts the precursor to serotonin, which is tryptophan, into a different pathway that actually makes um, excitotoxins. So um, instead of having um, a good effect and making um, serotonin, instead it shunts it into a different pathway where you get um, excitatory uh, damage from glutamate, excess glutamate, and also uh, excitotoxicity that results in decreased um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So you can see here, um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor goes down um, and neurogenesis goes down. 
So you have loss at the presynaptic terminal, less synthesis of, of um, transmitters that you need, such as serotonin and dopamine. Um, and then you also actually have toxicity from the products that are made. Here it's showing the effect of BDNF stimulating these neural stem cells, which are the ones that uh, regenerate uh, new, new brain cells um, in the hippocampus. So um, all of these are effects that will exacerbate depression. You can see that by having less of the important neurotransmitters, that would lead to a state in which we have less of an opportunity to rebalance the brain. Um, and this is just um, explaining a little bit more about the one particular pathway I told you about, <coughs> that this that it increases uh, the expression of IDO, which converts tryptophan into kynurene, which is kind of down the wrong pathway, like I was saying. And it's metabolized to quinolinic acid, and it's, it's uh, an NMDA agonist, so that helps the transmitter glutamate, which can be excitotoxic, um, and it interferes with brain-derived neurotrophic factor and with neurogenesis. Finally, um, the conversion of tryptophan diverts it from the pathway of serotonin synthesis, and thus um, there's less serotonin for, available for mood regulation pathways. And this is just showing you schematically what I was saying, that here tryptophan goes into this pathway um, down to quinolinic acid, which is an excitotoxin, rather than into a pathway that would take it in this direction where it would make serotonin. So um, besides affecting depression, there are other disease processes that inflammation affects. Um, it's not just depression. Um, and as you can see here, that kind of makes sense because um, when you think about common illnesses, they have they have some common predisposing factors such as obesity, um, early life adversity. Um, for example, people who have early life adversity, early life um, abuse or neglect or um, other kinds of stressors, continue to have an elevated risk of a variety of different diseases such as cardiovascular disease, um, such as uh, even diabetes throughout life. It, it is something that never changes in, have, in being disproportionately represented. Um, similarly, there are genetic predispositions that are shared by many diseases. Um, and so then in the presence of inflammation, whatever these diseases are with these predisposing factors, um, you have an exacerbation of that, of that negative outcome with um, further exaggerated stress responses um, cycling back to exacerbating the illness. Um, so these are some of the most common diseases, but they're, it's certainly not um, an exhaustive list. So some of the ones where inflammation really is a significant mediator include um, mild cognitive impair impairment. It, it is uh, on the pathway to Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, um, a number of different um, irritable bowel syndromes, um, and obesity, of course. And all of them have as a common mediator the influence of neuroinflammation. And this, this is kind of breaking it down into showing that it's not just the, it's not just the, uh, the inflammatory cytokines, but also um, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, um, the loss of feedback of the stress hormones, uh, so so-called um, resistance, glucocorticoid resistance, um, where the brain no longer has the appropriate regulation of cortisol. Um, and so what you end up getting is this vicious uh, circle where, um, you know, you have inflammation leading to depression, leading to medical illness, and, and actually the arrows go this way too. <laughs> so medical illness leading to depression, leading to inflammation, leading to stress. 
it, 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 you can go around and around the clock this way or you can go around and around the other direction. But it, it just shows you that once you have enough of these factors, it gets very hard to, to um, interrupt this cycle. Um, and this is one illustration um, of those relationships. So taking cardiovascular disease, it's showing that when you have um, a predisposition to cardiac disease, such as myocardial ischemia, um, ventricular arrhythmias, you have a diseased heart, um, you ha and you have stressors, so a hyperactive hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and um, sympathetic nervous system, these feed back onto the immune cells, which then, as we talked about earlier, go into the brain, um, result in activated macrophages, and further exacerbate this stress cycle. We also um, have the effect of uh, catecholamines activating platelets, which then help form the atherosclerotic lesions that you see. So you have the blood vessels getting clogged um, because of the, the influence of the immune cells and um, of catecholamines and um, of cortisol. Um, finally, you have, just as you have in inflammation, you have the effects on the autonomic nervous system which uh, further feeds into this into this cycle, um, and we could we could have used a different example. We could have used gastrointestinal illness and looked at some of the same factors of inflammation, um, or we could have looked at the fact that mild cognitive impairment has um, increases in inflammation that have been seen in the time period leading up to the beginning of the mild cognitive impairment and then progressing on to Alzheimer's disease that those inflammatory factors also play a role there. So um, so I, I don't want to pretend that it's just uh, cardiovascular disease or it's just depression. This is um, a kind of general medical factor. Um, so what can we do about that? What could we do to interrupt this uh, vicious cycle. Um, so some of the things that we know we can do that are protective are exercise. <coughs> There's very good um, evidence that people who receive an adequate amount of exercise um, have um, lower circulating inflammatory factors. Um, diet, um, so whether it's just maintaining a good, healthy diet, or actually um, there have now been some studies of intermittent fasting, um, such as people do for religious um, uh, reasons or um, for health reasons, but in any case, having an intermittent um, fasting cycle does appear to pretty significantly reduce inflammatory factors. Um, getting adequate sleep. Um, they've done a lot of studies showing that people who are chronically sleep deprived have higher levels of inflammation. Um, well, this is one that's hard <laughs> to arrange in modern life, but uh, if, if people can simply figure out a way to decrease the stress that they're under, of course, that also leads to decreases in inflammation. Um, and, and, you know, finding a way for those people who have depression to get the depression treated sufficiently is, is a final way in which we can definitely decrease um, the amount of inflammation. So uh, it's kind of a checkerboard. Maybe people can't do all of those, but the more they can do, the more they can uh, protect themselves against inflammation. So finally, what about antidepressant treatment effects? Um, there is one thing we can do to uh, clearly, if possible, interrupt the cycle, and that's to treat depression and get people who have depression better so they aren't kind of going around and around this cycle. The other thing that we can do is we can actually treat the inflammation. So, um, so there's now evidence for both of those uh, things, as well, of course, as medical illness and stress. But um, 
there is some data that treating with anti-inflammatory medication can augment the antidepressant response. Um, so if you um, are trying to treat depression and you're not getting a good response with a traditional <clears throat> course of antidepressants, so in some studies there's an augmentive effect of adding in anti-inflammatory uh, medication. And we're uh, here at Penn, we're currently conducting a treatment trial in people over 60 to test that, that hypothesis. We think that people who have a less complete response to antidepressants may have higher levels of inflammatory factors, um, which can be lowered by antidepressants partially, but may do better with a combination of anti-inflammatory agents and antidepressants. So what we're doing is actually looking in the cerebrospinal fluid of people, in other words, conducting spinal taps before and after treatment with depression to see if um, it is these higher levels of inflammatory factors that are getting in the way of treatment response. And then for the people who have persistently elevated levels of inflammation um, and who don't get better from traditional antidepressant treatment, we can then add in an anti-inflammatory agent to, um, to see if that directly uh, uh, helps them get better from their depression. Um, so, like I said, decreasing depression dampens down the inflammatory response indirectly and stops the vicious cycle. Antidepressants may have a direct effect. So there's some evidence that antidepressants have a direct effect on the inflammation factors themselves. Um, and then antidepressants, in addition uh, to uh, affecting the inflammation factors, they, they increase compliance with treatment regimens for medical illnesses that can get in the way, such as hypertension, diabetes, and cardiac disease. So that's the end of this talk. Um, just to summarize, um, we talked about an evolutionary perspective, why it is that people um, now have this increased inflammation that gets in the way of feeling better, um, what the in inflammation pathways to a negative outcome are, um, what, what specifically the inflammation factors are, and what the inflammatory cell types, namely microglia, are <coughs> that perpetuate the response, um, the brain effects of inflammation, um, the fact that inflammation affects multiple disease processes, um, some evidence that there are factors that decrease inflammation, factors that we can actually control, thank goodness, um, and finally, um, antidepressant treatment response, treatment effects, and uh, some of the newer data suggesting that, uh, in fact, by augmenting with anti-inflammatory agents, we may get a better antidepressant treatment effect. So I'll stop there and take questions. Great. Um, that thank you very much. Uh, um, you were able to take some very complicated information and um, put it into a context that I think is uh, very useful to people who are listening. And one of the questions that we received a, a few times had to do with uh, the anti-inflammatory agents that you're using in your studies. Could you tell us a little bit about which agents you think might be most effective uh, for these purposes? Uh huh. Sure. So in our study, what we're doing is we're first, you know, when we do antidepressant treatment trials, our first hypothesis is that people may not have been treated adequately or with sufficient doses or for sufficient time. So the first thing we do is we put them into a standard um, SSRI treatment trial and just see. And you'd be surprised. There are quite a few people who get better just from that. But then for people who don't, um, in our study, we're using an experimental protocol where we add in um, a COX-2 inhibitor that um, is, is available on the market, so you could get this yourself, um, and it comes with a variety of different generic names, but basically, um, uh, celecoxib is one of them, um, and, uh, you know, we, we feel that, 
the evidence is not there yet to go out and recommend that people do that it does have some some risk factors but if we can show um, in our treatment trial that people get a better antidepressant response um, with adding in silicoxib then then we'll be happy <laughs> great excellent I just want to emphasize an important point you made at the beginning of your response which is that um, there are people who might have appeared not to respond to treatment but may not have had um, the full maximum dose or the the full amount of time that it sometimes exactly. takes for the treatment to be effective and that's important for people to keep in mind to make sure that they are receiving the full dose and giving enough time for that dose to work. Could you say a little bit about your experience with that? Because I'm sure there are people sure. listening in who so, have had that yeah, I've, experience. I've been doing antidepressant treatment trials for a long, long time. <laughs> and I'm always impressed by, I used to think um, that there were just um, a fair number of bad doctors out there. <laughs> and then I realized, well, it's kind of a combination because People are so desperate to get better. Of course they are. I mean, they're feeling miserable. They want to feel better. And so they're telling their, their doctor, I, you know, I got to do something. Do something else. Do something more. And so then uh, these changes start to get made. And then it ends up seeming as if nothing has worked. But you may have only had somebody be on a few weeks of this and then a few weeks of that. And so the net effect is that they haven't had a full treatment trial of an antidepressant. And that's why I think it's so important to, or they, or a lot of times I see people who will change doctors, like one doctor, then another doctor, then another doctor. And so nobody's really managing um, the treatment. And I think, I think those situations really are unfortunate because then you don't know if the person has had an adequate um, treatment trial. Um, so you you really want to be sure that the simple things work first before you move on to other things. So the, if somebody is taking a medicine but not yet at the full dose of the medicine, uh, as a general rule of thumb, and there's always exceptions to that, it makes sense to build up to that full dose as long as they're able to tolerate that without side effects, exactly. et cetera, to see if that medicine would work. Right, exactly, and to be on it for long enough to give it a chance. Right. Um, the uh, w one of the questions somebody asks is: Is there a way for a person to know if they are having inflammation um, in the context of their depression? How, can somebody on their own be able to tell that they are a person with inflammation? Yeah. No, you really wouldn't know that. Um, there's no. Um, there's no symptom in your body or anything simple that would tell you that. I mean, the only way to know is to actually um, have pretty fancy tests done for these inflammation factors. Um, and then the other complicating thing is even if you have those tests, it's not yet, there's no standard level that is like this is clearly inflammation this is too much inflammation and that isn't so that's what's being worked out right now is i mean what i'd love would be in the future if we you know if you know your glucose is supposed to be 100 and not higher and not lower well what should your inflammation levels be and then we could could really direct people into one treatment or another but um so what's being done right now is above a certain amount of inflammation um, and, and those levels change um, depending on who's doing the study. Um, it's thought to be like this is clearly increased inflammation and, and that you know by working with a, a doctor you could figure out like yeah I really do have increased inflammation levels then uh, somebody who had you know quite high inflammation levels could be treated with an anti-inflammatory. If it was just a little high is that good enough reason to be on an anti-inflammatory in addition to an antidepressant? We don't know. That's that's exactly what the study I'm doing right now is taking a look at. So kind of really high or really low, we could say like, no, you really don't have any inflammation. Or yeah, you really do have inflammation. But in the middle where maybe you've got a little, 
do we have evidence that adding in an anti-inflammatory to an antidepressant will improve you? Jury's out. Okay. Um, you you spoke about diet and uh, good healthy uh, eating habits and perhaps intermittent fasting. Are there uh -huh. any types of foods that people should be thinking about to avoid or or to have more of that may be useful in terms of the inflammation issue? Well, there's a huge nutrition literature on the inflammatory effects of animal meat. Um, I happen to have in my family <laughs> a rabid nutritionist, my brother, who's a family doc, <laughs> who um, is a rabid vegan. And he could, I don't have these articles, but he could point you to, and, and I do believe he's correct, um, that um, especially red meat, but also any kind of um, animal meat um, has increased inflammatory factors that may be promoting inflammation in all of us. So um, the kinds of things you want to eat are the green leafy vegetables, fruits. I mean, every kind of fruit and vegetable is going to be anti-inflammatory. Um, and grains, so plenty of grains. Um, and also not in too high a quantity because that we know that ob obesity is um, is inflammation promoting. So keeping on the lean side and eating plenty of fruits and vegetables and grains. Fish, I I I, I think the jury's out on fish. I don't think I don't know of anything bad about fish. Okay, so things that people again, it's it is that general healthy diet. Um, yes. and the Mediterranean that, that diet. Think of. Yeah. Right. It. Um, I want to ask you to a little bit explain just in the broadest of terms about inflammation because some of the people in our audience who are certainly not scientists but are very interested in this are asking questions just a better understanding of the, the inflammation process in the body. And can mm -hmm. you say just a little bit about that in the most basic level so that uh, some of the people can better understand that? Okay, so I gave lots of um, specific enzymes and, and factors and so forth. It boils down to this. Um, your body is primed to um, respond against factors that it perceives as foreign. And that, so in, but it can even be from your own gut, right? And also um, things that prime it to do that are stressors. So if you're stressed, then your body is going to produce these either circulating hormones and circulating factors like cytokines, or it's going to um, goose up these um, monocytes that become activated microglia. So it, it becomes a sort of vicious cycle where um, you activate certain kinds of um, inflammation cells and you activate certain inflammation factors that then enter the brain and that process of of having things overactivated um, is what we call inflammation good thank you thank you it's a, a, a good basic um, uh, definition mm -hmm. uh, if somebody's listening now and they or a loved one um, have been getting receiving treatment for depression and it's mm -hmm. not working you've already given the advice to make sure that they are maximizing the course with particular mm -hmm. medicine um, mm -hmm. if that doesn't work what should they do next mm -hmm. well so inflammation is not the only problem <laughs> Um, so certainly doing all the things to help somebody not have inflammation is one thing. But there are some people who just have more severe depression. So that even if, like let's take a case where hypothetically you had treated with antidepressants and um, you also had done all the things that were going to contain inflammation. Maybe you had even been on an anti-inflammatory agent, but still the person was persisting in having a really severe case of depression. Then, I, then there are um, centers, doctors, who specialize in treating particularly refractory 
um, depression. And so I think, you know, in consultation with, with a doctor, it might be time if they have this severe kind of depression to get um, kind of the most help you can get from things that are stronger. And those could be things like electroconvulsive therapy. Um, it could be, for some people, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is really in a developing phase where we're starting to understand more about it and see what the specific effects are. Um, some people have had remarkable success with vagus nerve stimulation um, or at the extreme deep brain stimulation. I mean, these are all extremes, except for ECT, which is the most underutilized treatment we have. Um, and, you know, when somebody has severe depression, God forbid that we don't get them the treatment because the worst thing that can happen is that they just give up and and commit suicide, which is, you know, so preventable, so, so preventable. So for anybody listening who has somebody where they are really worried about that person, then absolutely getting them maximal help is, is what needs to happen. All right, so it's a very important point about the, the issue of suicide and suicide prevention and mm -hmm. that people shouldn't give up, that just because exactly. it hasn't worked up till now, there are other alternatives. And I, I would say often a good approach would be if there is an academic institution um, right. not too far away from home, they often would be able to have the resources to, to right. help with some of these options that you just described. Exactly. They'll have a concentration of people who specialize in the more severe forms of illness. I mean, be that right. depression or be it schizophrenia or be it whatever, that's going to be probably a, a good option for people. Right. I, I, you bring up other illnesses. Is there information that you could share with us about the issue of inflammation and some of the other illnesses such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? So um, particularly, so bipolar disorder, absolutely. The same things I've been saying um, about major depression would be absolutely generalizable to bipolar disorder. Um, in schizophrenia, there's some really interesting evidence about kind of early, early inflammation that may have triggered things. Um, I think there's less evidence that this is an ongoing problem in schizophrenia than in, say, bipolar illness or depression. But um, but certainly it can be a factor there as well. And in the when talking about bipolar, um, it, is it for both the manic phase and the depressed periods, or is it more just in the depression periods? It's more in the depression period because, like I was saying, um, what it really what inflammation really interferes with is um, the synthesis of the neurotransmitters serotonin and dopamine. And so those are more involved in, in mood regulation. And inflammation itself produces, I may not have said this clearly enough, the, the, when you have something like, say, interferon alpha, which is an incredibly strong <laughs> treatment that's used in hepatitis C, People feel just miserably sick. They feel um, fatigued and they feel complete loss of motivation or, and loss of pleasure. So the kind of precursors or the, what we used to call vegetative symptoms of depression. Um, and as those go on, then it morphs into a full-blown depression. But the first thing is really just um, what what inflammation does, which is to make you feel sick. And some people from an evolutionary standpoint have, have hypothesized that, well, when you're sick, you stay out of the way of other people, so you're not going to get um, stabbed to death by your caveman <laughs> peers, and you're not going to get eaten by a lion because you're just kind of hunkering down and feeling sick. So the, the point of having inflammation is to make you be stationary and, and uh, not go out into the world. So it, it is more of a sort of thing that goes along with depression. Okay, you know, and I think your point is about the, the sickness behaviors such as fatigue, uh, mm -hmm. loss of pleasure, really fit in very nicely with what people who have depression experience exactly. as well. So, yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. 
And how about um, anxiety? Does it fit into people who have anxiety, il illnesses with anxiety or anxiety in and of itself? Uh, that's a hard one <laughs> because um, it's so hard to tell anxiety and depression apart. Um, you know, they really go hand in glove. And so um, if I, if you told me that it made people with anxiety feel better, I would be wondering, well, were they really people with depression who had a very anxious sort of depression? Um, so we're actually going to be looking at that in our latest grant where we're looking across what the NIH calls negative valence syndromes, and we're looking across um, depression and anxiety and PTSD and all the things with that kind of negative slant to them to see if we can tease apart the brain variables and the, and the symptom variables that cut across the disorders. The, uh, so uh, the other one that I was going to ask you, you just mentioned, post-traumatic stress is another one that potentially, which has you know, a lot of depressed symptoms as well as anxiety, uh, exactly. is another one that may be affected by this. Exactly, exactly. And is there any um, anything that you could say about for people who have tragically died as a result of suicide, is there evidence that people who have passed away um, or even people who have serious suicide attempts, um, that there is a greater degree of inflammation in those Absolutely. individuals? Absolutely. When I, yeah, when, I, when I showed you those slides of activated microglia, that's mm -hmm. where the evidence came from showing that it was the activated microglia that were more common in people with depression. Um, like I was saying, it's not all the way to the extreme forms because, for instance, in multiple sclerosis, it's just a huge whopping inflammation response that you get. Um, so it's not to that degree, but certainly at, um, having not stationary, not the nice little quiet microglia, but the ones that are activated, those are seen um, in a higher number in people who have passed away from suicide. Okay. The, uh, I want to say a little bit more about the relationship between some of the medical conditions, inflammation and depression. And you focused on cardiovascular, and we know that people who have a heart attack have a you know, higher risk of depression after having a heart attack, and in fact, untreated depression after a heart attack is a risk factor for, for a bad medical outcome. Exactly. I, what? I, I forget what the mortality is, but it's some really quite increased mortality if you have depression with your heart attack and you don't get it treated. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen reports that say untreated depression after a heart attack is even worse than untreated hypertension um, which, or untreated high cholesterol. That, that the right. untreated depression is the worst thing you could you could you can do, and mm -hmm. therefore the most important thing to make sure treatment occurs. It, exactly. Um, are, are you and your studies looking at that population as well, or really more just the straight so depression? So we're, well, we're not um, we are not excluding them, um, other than so they have to have a heart that's healthy enough to be treated with an antidepressant to be in our study. And so if, they're, um, if the, their QRS, uh, their EKG complex was too wide, um, which would mean that their heart had, um, was, was somewhat unhealthy, then we wouldn't be able to include them in the study. But otherwise, a history of heart attacks or even arrhythmias or anything like that, we would, we would include them because we want to understand about that. Right. Right. There's um, a couple of people asking about traumatic brain injury and mm -hmm. how this relates to uh, inflammatory factors, et cetera. I'm curious if you could say a little bit about that. So now you're kind of getting further afield than I can really give you a definitive answer. <laughs> okay. but, um, but I would say um, TBI um, sets into motion um, a, a series of inflammatory pathways um, just because you've got this injury and anytime you've got injury you've got inflammation right so yeah. um, so yes it would it would definitely be present there um, and certainly lots of people with TBI have depression so I, 
although I don't know the statistics and so forth, I would say I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be a factor in TBI, um, that both depression and inflammation would, would be factors involved. And then there's also the evidence. I mean, here's, here's some indirect evidence. People with TBI go on to a, a higher rate of um, mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And one of the pathways um, is thought to be inflammation. So um, even though I don't know whether people have looked at, at, um, at TBI brains where people have passed away and found these inflammatory factors, I would pretty strongly guess that the answer is yes. Okay. Well, that sounds like future areas of endeavor in terms of research <laughs> right. uh, by you and, and others. Um, and um, how about the role of, uh, above and beyond medicine, the role of talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, other therapeutic um, interventions for depression? Has there been so any studies about that? Absolutely. Actually, you're an audience plant, Jeff. <laughs> We're just sending off a paper that looks at the brain effects of cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, so we did studies where we gave, um, this is your standard 12-week sessions where you meet with a cognitive behavioral therapist who does does the CBT by the book. In other words, it's completely standardized so we can be sure that everybody got the same thing. And what we found was after 12 weeks of therapy, the brains, you could see in the, in the brain imaging that um, the cognitive control areas, the prefrontal cortex, um, had greater activity during a task that we were using to assess um, to assess how well the people did a task and then looked at the how how much their brains lit up and people with depression had low levels of activity before treatment and higher afterwards significantly higher um, likewise the connectivity you know the the brain connections the functional connections between those areas and other parts of the brain improved with CBT so um, you know CBT really does change the brain I can't I can't say myself anything about generalized talk therapy. Um, I would I'm pretty sure it it does, but it's much harder to show that because um, I mean each therapist is different. But when we do CBT, we can make it be all the same. Like on on day one, we go through the strategies, then you go home and you do your homework, and you come back and you check in again and you do more homework. So learning coping strategies for all the negative thoughts and and uh, all the catastrophizing that people tend to do when they're depressed. Well, um, this has been really a, a, uh, an outstanding presentation and great uh, Q&A. Obviously, based on the questions, you see tremendous interest on the part of our audience. And that I just want to thank you for um, the work that you've been doing and continue to do and certainly taking time to join us today um, to share this very important information. So thank you uh, oh, very, you're welcome. very much. My pleasure. Uh, thank I'll, you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, also, I want to thank the people who joined us um, today. Um, and uh, all of the research that we fund is made possible through private donations. And if you'd like to make a gift, please visit our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call our 800 number, 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded, so if you've missed any portion of it or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, please visit the webinar page on our website. Um, I hope people will join us again next month um, when Dr. Fritz Hen, Professor of Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, will present a webinar on bipolar disorder. This will take place on Tuesday, January 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, as this is our final webinar for 2016, I want to thank everybody uh, for their participation um, and uh, joining us for these webinars. We're looking forward to having you join us in 2017 um, with, again, uh, wonderful topics and a dynamic group of scientific presentations, um, and I want to take this opportunity to wish 
everybody and their families a very happy holidays and a happy, healthy uh, new year. So once again, thank you all very much.